Anything smaller than an eighth note is an ornament, as far as I'm mm. concerned. It doesn't have to be there. So you don't have to go, right? Exactly. You don't have to do that. That's the one I was thinking Right? You can phrase the music how you like. Well, I had such an enjoyable and informative conversation with Marla Fibers here that I'm excited to share with you all. And if you don't know Marla's work for some reason, then you have to go check out her amazing stuff because she, in my opinion, is one of the main proponents of the Irish mandolin scene these days. She has some amazing solo recordings that are all mandolin-centric in the Irish vein. And she also has a project called Knocked Buell with Bruce Victor, and you can check out their touring schedule below here. On top of that, Marla's just an incredibly talented and well-spoken instructor. She teaches at camps worldwide. I've taken a few of her classes myself. She also has a course over on Peckhead Nation all about Irish mandolin that you should check out. Again, links in the description below. Be sure to support Marla and her music because in this video, we got pretty deep together. I unloaded all my weighted questions about Irish mandolin, the history of the instrument and this music, the history of the techniques that we use on the instrument, general practice performance, all sorts of stuff like that. And I'm excited to dive in with you all here. So here we go. Marla, it is so awesome to get to talk with you here. I was thinking about the last time we uh, got together. I think it must have been at the Swannanoa Gathering years ago, and before that at the Mandolin Symposium. When you were a pup. I know, right? <laughs> I was probably like maybe 17 years old at the time, and you're the first person to tell me about like the down, up, down, down, up, down jig picking pattern, and it totally changed my life. Once you got over wanting to strangle me. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough at first. But yeah, I, uh, I'm just excited to get to chat and you know get to learn more about Irish music as well, and um, I was thinking, you know, I first started playing in an Irish band a long time ago when I was in high school, and I didn't really know much about the music then. I feel like I still don't know too much about it now. <laughs> I feel like I know embarrassingly little about the history of the instrument in Celtic music as well, and was hoping we could talk a bit more about that. Could you walk us through, like, the early history of the mandolin, like, when it first started appearing in this style of music, and who some of those first influential players were on this instrument? Yeah, I'll do my best. I'll do my best because I kind of stumbled in a little further along down the line. I'm sure there was the odd mandolin in the odd kitchen hanging on the wall and getting plinked on, you know, from time to time prior to the uh, sort of folk revival years. But it was really the folk revival years um, as they came to Ireland in the late 50s and the 60s um, that um, you started to see mandolins used in the um in the bands and it, so the irish folk bands like the the dubliners and the mm -hmm. clancy brothers and and they all used um mandolins but always as a adjunct not always it, it they there was some tune playing on the mandolin but mostly as an adjunct to the songs right oh cool so as kind of a folk accompaniment instrument just as it was kind of in the folk revival years in the States, being used in the States more and more in that way as well. That's so interesting. I didn't realize that it had origins as an accompaniment instrument at first. I always, for some reason, assumed it was a melody instrument, but that makes sense. Like kind of the tying to the bazooki and the guitar as well. Was all that kind of happening at the same time, those instruments coming into the music? Yeah, bazooki just a little bit later. Um, okay. Yeah, so as mandolin started to be more prevalent, um, so somebody who plays Irish music, obviously, um, is also going to want to play the jigs and the reels mm -hmm. on the instrument as well. So that's when that started as well. I should say accelerated as well, because I have no doubt that a jig was played on a mandolin <laughs> prior to those years, but um, we didn't really hear about it, right? It wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't embraced by, uh, say, Coltus, the organization that... Um, was uh, a key player in the revival uh, of Irish music within Ireland. And they started in the 50s. Mm. Um, and, but they didn't include mandolin as a instrument in their competition structure, which I can explain more about if you want, um, until like the late 80s or 90s. Oh. Um, it it might have even been later. It was always the there would be the odd mandolin com competing in the miscellaneous category, along with the, you know, 
Lord knows what <laughs> other outliers. Um, That's so interesting. You know. So it's a relatively new instrument to the music, I guess, in you know comparison to the bagpipes or the fiddle or other instruments in Celtic music, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the fiddle's got like a, a hundred year lead shall we say, the mm -hmm. fiddle was real, kind of mid-1800s, it kind of became popular in Irish music, and you know, the pipes are older. Um, the harp tradition, much older. Mm -hmm. um, pipes required a little bit of technology to, to get them sort of to, to be the instrument they are today. But yeah, and then concertinas and accordions came in in the 1880s, uh, 90s, as that technology developed. Banjo started coming in from the States um, mm -hmm. in the 19 teens and 20s because there was a huge uh, banjo craze in, mm -hmm. the, in the States, right? And right. it made its way over to Ireland and started, that was kind of the first plectrum instrument that got pulled in uh, into or adapted for uh, playing the dance music of Ireland. Taking notes as we go along because I feel like yeah, I want to remember all this stuff here. So the tenor banjo was the first, or was it a tenor banjo or was it? Yeah, yeah, plectrum banjo or tenor banjo, four string banjo, um, which, you know, was originally tuned CGDA, right? Okay. And um, Irish musicians quite naturally uh, tuned it like a fiddle, like an octave fiddle, right? To make it natural to play the tunes on. So mm -hmm. the, the GDAE tuning started and you know the banjo really took off um but it wasn't you know another 40 years later at least that mandolin started coming in as much um and really and this is something i love talking about because i think a lot of the way the mandolin has has been played up until kind of more recently mm -hmm. and, but also still within irish music is uh, very much um a mapping of banjo technique onto the mandolin. Ah, yeah, I was curious about that. Like being a relatively new instrument, if there were other instruments that mandolin kind of takes after. And tenor banjo, you think would be primary? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And it's kind of a little, um, a little bugaboo of mine <laughs> that I, I, I like to get people to th think about playing the mandolin for its own um, array of properties. Right. Right. So rather than mm -hmm. just treating it like a little double strung banjo, right. <laughs> <laughs> bring out its its you know, it has this sweet tone and sustain and it can bring other things to the music that that the banjo um doesn't. So we can take the that rhythmic activity from the from the plectrum banjo tradition, um, but I feel like we need to bring in more stuff that's kind of more closely related to the fiddle. Right. That we're kind of riding that um, continuum between banjo and fiddle. And I, I, I like to bring out the, fiddly, the fiddlier bits um, of the, of the attri or attributes of the mandolin. When do you think the mandolin started having its own identity in Irish music? Like, were there, there any players in particular that made the mandolin their main instrument and helped elevate it to something besides just an eight string banjo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's interesting. You, you, you use the term main instrument. Almost right. nobody only plays the mandolin, really? right? Yeah. Almost everybody um, either plays like mandolin and bazooki and guitar or mandolin and banjo, sort mm. of, you know. Um, but the, the people who really elevated the mandolin um, in the music, I would say uh, Andy Irvine is, of course, um, a, say, a yeah. first name that comes to mind. Paul Kelly. Um, um, interestingly, um, there are a lot of great mandolin players out there that you never know actually also play mandolin because you don't hear about them. Really? Uh, for example, when I was, I had, was doing some research around this topic um, for a workshop some time ago, and I was pulling out cuts of uh, Andy Irvin and Paul Brady playing together. So, and then yeah. I actually read the liner notes and some of that amazing mandolin playing was Paul Brady. Really? I had no yeah. idea. 
Oh my goodness, yeah. that's crazy. That kind of like blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but doesn't lead as a Mando player. So it, it, it's interesting. So most of the of the uh, leading names are, are multi-instrumentalists. But I think that's, that is changing and has changed. And mm -hmm. some of that is um, the American mandolin tradition um, making its, having its influences. Onto, mm -hmm. the, onto, onto the Irish music tradition, you know, players like David Surrett, may he rest in peace, mm -hmm. um, players like myself, you know, uh, I lead as a mandolin player. I, yes, I do play other instruments, but for me, everything's derived from mandolin. And then players like yourself who play Irish music on the mandolin, but play other kinds of music on the mandolin as well. So, so you come from a place of mandolin and a, a array of musical traditions. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Ireland, it's sort of, you don't have that many uh, people who are oriented towards the instrument. They're more or, oriented towards the music um, and play it on mandolin and other instruments. It's kind of interesting. You know? Yeah. I never thought of that before. I, I do sometimes feel like I'm, a, I'm an orphan of musical styles in some way, even though I grew up in the South, I feel like I should be like really into bluegrass and I love bluegrass, but I didn't grow up playing it or listening to it. And um, being from Ireland, I can imagine, you know, folks over there, they just live and breathe the tradition and whatever instrument they play, it just kind of ekes out. I'm kind of jealous of that. That's awesome. I, I know. I remember when I was first playing, thinking, Oh, how I wish I grew up playing this music. And now looking back, you know, I was 20. <laughs> so that was actually pretty early. I teach people who are just starting as, you know, in their midlife, right? But you make a point about like, if you've heard the music your whole life, it's so much easier to get the feel of the music on whatever instrument you're picking up, right? Mm. Whereas if, uh, I'm teaching quite often people who have not heard the music their whole life are coming to it now. I, I feel they need much more of a dependency on technique, if you will, to get the pulse of the music. For instance, the down, up, down, down, up, down. Jig picking gets the pulse of the jig into your physical approach on the instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I've seen players not use that technique, but still have a beautiful jig pulse because they know what a jig pulse it's supposed to sound like they've heard it their whole lives, you know. I was hoping to talk about that too because I've heard a lot of strong opinions on like mandolin <laughs> technique when it comes to playing Irish music, and yeah. um, so many people do it differently. And there's some so many great players who do different stuff. How does that tie back to the history of the instrument as well? I mean, I'm sure it's still a bit of an uncharted territory <laughs> taking this instrument to all this uh, ancient music, but. Um, like what, when did that particular technique, the, the jig picking pattern first arrive on the scene and what, what's been like your experience with it? And I, I mean, I, I find a lot of value in it. I know you find a lot of value in it too. Like how does it influence the way that the music comes across by using a technique like that? When it first sort of came on the scene, I don't really know. I'll preface this by saying I'm self-taught. There was nobody for me to learn from. And this is the early 1980s. And this is pre-internet and, you know, if you didn't have a teacher in your area and almost nobody played the mandolin on Irish music. And I had no idea how uh, fringe an instrument it was when I picked it up. And that's a whole other story I won't go into. But somehow, in it, so my learning process was listening to fiddle players, flute players, pipers, hearing the flow, the pulse, the rhythms, of the music and trying to get that on my instrument. So it was all sort of adaptive, if you will. And somehow in the course of doing that for jigs, I wound up playing down, up, down, down, up, down, down. Whoa. Up. Nobody told me that. <laughs> so awesome. when, wow. uh, when somebody who was much more savvy about, you know, the outside world than I was asked me, do you pick jigs down, up, down, down, up, down? Um, because they'd read about it, you know, and I was like, I have no idea. Watch me and tell me what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and it was like, sure enough, yes, you are. <laughs> so for me, it was the way to get that, the unique pulse of the jig into the sound, into the mandolin, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, I do have strong feelings about teaching it that way, um, 
be, because one of the things that I hear in um, a lot of American players is a um, not enough of a stress on the third beat of what I call the jiglet. So the yeah. one, two, three, one, two, three. I, because I talk about it so much, I call it. I had to give it a name. <laughs> the jiglet. <laughs> a jiglet, yeah. So <laughs> the third beat of the jiglet has a stress, right? One, mm -hmm. two, three, one, two, three, one, ba -do, ba -do. and you you hear um, a lot of American playing going da 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 and you're just like, ah, ha, ha. or uh, that's my response. It's like, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> that's not how jigs go. But anyway, so if you think about the mechanics of down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, that's going to get that pull and one, three, one into your physical body. And then you add that with tapping your foot on that one, and you're gonna get that, um, y you have a better chance of getting the pulse into your playing if your physicality matches the pulse of the music. That's m my approach. When I first tried it out, when, it, when you told me about this at the mandolin symposium, and uh, you know, wanted to just burn my mandolin because it was so hard, after I got <laughs> used to it, I feel like going back to alternate picking now and making it sound like that with the the strong third beat of the jiglet, it would be harder to use alternate picking than to use like the down, up, down, down, up, down motion, which it's, you know, and I admire people who can like do the alternate picking and make it sound natural, make it sound with that strong third beat because I sure can't, <laughs> you know, it would be really hard. <laughs> I've never, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't even know how to try actually, yeah. you know. You know, you can take the approach that if I am in control of my instrument, I can stress whatever beat. I want with my picking. And we do that when we're playing, right? To add in little anticipations and syncopations and things like that, right? But um, to, to create a consistent pulse without your physicality matching that pulse, I, I would find that very difficult. Um, but as I said, that like I've seen players do it, but they're always players who've heard the music their whole life. Yeah. That pulse is inside them. They wouldn't know how to play a jig without it, you know? Does this technique cross over to other plucked drum instruments in the style too? Like I know there are some tenor banjo players who do it, but are there like guitar players who do this as well, bazooki players? That's a great question. And I think when you're, when they're playing melody, I think they absolutely do. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're playing backup, it might go to a, do, 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 you know, it might okay. go to an alternation. Um, it's harder mm -hmm. to get across all those strings if you're wanting mm -hmm. to hit more than just a melody note while you're jig picking, but I've seen it both ways with that. Also, baron players. Baron players will sometimes go, you know, sorry, <laughs> I have the wrong motion in my, but if they can, some some go down, up, down, down, up, down, and some go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, you know, so. Oh, I didn't think of that. It's interesting. Speaking of accompaniment too, um, I've always been a little scared to play like accompaniment on the mandolin for Irish stuff. <laughs> like, I don't, that's just my problem, but like, I, <laughs> No, it's not just your problem. <laughs> well, it's, it's it, you know, encouraging to hear that, you know, it's been an accompaniment instrument from the start and I need to get over that fear. But like what, what's been your approach to honoring that tradition, but also, you know, trying to make the mandolin have its own identity nowadays? I try to take the same uh, approach as a bazooki would, which is a, a contrapuntal sort of accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Bits of melody, bits of counterpoint. It, like, not a full-on strummy strum. Um, if it's a jig, I'm going to keep my jig picking going. And within that jig picking, I'll be hitting some double stops. I'll be hitting a few um, little melody bits thrown in, little counterpoint, little harmony bits. Um, I am not particularly good at it. I can talk about it. <laughs> but it's not something that I excel at by any means. I've, I've heard... Um, uh, players do it much better than I do. And and I actually um, enjoy picking up, every now and then in a session, I'll pick up the mandola and I'll, and I'll we'll do it on that. Um, I, I feel a little more comfortable using the mandola in that way because um, I have it in a slightly open tuning. So that mm -hmm. helps a little bit with the oh, okay. drony character that, that we love in the <laughs> Irish music accompaniment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So would that be a similar yeah. tuning to what they do on the bazooki as well? It is similar. So bazooki is quite often, well, there's sort of two approaches. There's the 
um, GD, GDAD, GDAD, so tuning the high E right. down. So you get two Ds that way, right? Mm -hmm. The other approach, which is sort of the one I use for the mandola, is tuning the bottom string up a step to, an, to it would be ADAE uh. or ADAD. So you're getting some droning. If you leave the E on the top, it's easier to play little melody bits if you're used to playing a mandolin, right? right? But a lot of players also use this ADAD, so you get a nice droney um, bit, and you just get used to the two strings that are not in your mandolin things. So my mandola approach is just the mandola version of ADAE, which is DGDA. Okay. I tune D the C up to a D. So I've got two Ds. Um, and my top three strings let me play transposed melody, so. I would be so lost doing ADAD. I feel like I would just be like, <laughs> what on earth am I playing? This is not a mandolin. But <laughs> I have done, um, like I have a, an octave mandolin that I got recently that I have done the GDAD on. And um, that feels like really nice. I actually recorded a couple songs with, with oh, nice. Tabitha on, on this thing and you know, tuned it that way and felt like it had a really nice open sound. But yeah. um, I've not done that too much on the mandolin. That would be kind of fun to mess around with. I imagine with the open tunings, it's a lot easier to get like the sustain and that contrapuntal stuff that you talked about with the drones and um, and the extra lines on the lower strings. For I mean, for folks who've never heard it before, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you maybe give us like a little sampling of what that would sound like? So I have the mandolin right here. So uh, uh, let's see. See, I'm going to my mandola shapes. So, um, so let's see, something like that. So take, so tune like that. You know, something yeah. like that. I'm not, as I say, I'm not particularly skilled at it. No, it but sounds I, beautiful, yeah. I create that, like, I just want to keep the jig picking going and then kind of a little noodly, right? Mm. Octaves, doubles, very, very rarely full, uh, full four string, four course chords or anything, you know? How do you walk that line in like a, an Irish session, if you were playing mando mandolin or mandola and you wanted to play accompaniment, do you do you think about like what the other players are playing for chords? Or if you're doubling accompaniment with someone else, um, are you playing more melodic stuff rather than chord shapes? Or how does that all influence your choices as an, as an accompanist? Yeah. Um, if there's somebody else playing accompaniment, usually I, I don't really. Sure. Um, but if if I'm if the spirit moves me, I'll just keep my eye on them mm -hmm. and see what and, and try and match uh, what they're doing. I can read Dadgad somewhat. <laughs> so uh, and if it's bazooki, of course I can read what they're like. You, you, you just get the the parameters are um, not so wide that if you're paying attention you can stay out of somebody's way, especially by, as you suggested, staying a little more melodic. Well, maybe another facet of playing too. I'm curious about what the history of embellishments are on the mandolin. Um, Cause I, I know like, if you look at all the embellishments that the, the pipes and the fiddles do that, you know, sound so amazing. And so I Irish and so Celtic, like some of that stuff doesn't really work on the mandolin. <laughs> and yeah. how do you, how do you walk that line between, you know, trying to, play something that sounds authentic but also that works on the instrument yeah that's kind of that's 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 the nut of it you you just kind of characterized it so there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors going sure. on right so mm. we can sort of pay attention if we listen uh to say how a fiddle player is approaching a jig take that same tune i was just playing or uh well what was that dum diddly Dum -da -da. So that's inside of a of a jiglet, to use my term again. <laughs> bum -da is changed to bum -da -da, 
right? Right. Um, as opposed to da ka dee da doo da da dee da da da, which would be a da ka da. If we understand that a triplet replaces two eighth notes with a da ka da, if we put it on the first eighth note of a jiglet, we get da ka dee da doo da dee da 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 da. If we put it on the second eighth note, we get dum da dee da dee da dee da dum. Right. So, and how do those align with different ornaments, say, on the fiddle or the flute or the pipes or something? Right. Diddly um, da is like a a, a bowed triplet. Kadida that puts it right on the stressed one. Right. Mm -hmm. um, whereas bombula is more like how a roll would fall in the music, where they state the note and then ornament it. Do diddly dumbula, you know, bambu, the five note ornament that we know as a roll, which um, I wouldn't attempt to do on the mandolin. There are um, some players who will, but I will. I will try to make my triplet fall in with the roll by how I place it in the meter, and mm. I'll also mute my triplet a little bit so it's not going dum da da da. It's going dum da dum da da da. Right. I'll try yeah. and keep keep it subtle. Right. Um, that one's on an open string, which of course you couldn't roll on anyway, so it's. Terrible example, but... <laughs> yeah. As opposed to... Both right. mallet ornaments, right? But different yeah. in terms of how do we match in. So I really love trying to figure out um, how do we fall in? How do we align? What, what ornaments are we um, recreating on our instrument? Um, cuts are, are challenging on mm -hmm. the mandolin, and I'm not good at them. That I've, some players are amazing. I was just watching a, a video where um, Martin Halley was playing. Oh, he's great. Um, yeah. yeah, he's fantastic, you know? And that da 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 thing um, is not something that I have in my playing, but I admire it. And uh, I find it difficult with the heavy double strings, you know, mm -hmm. um, to get that, that quick but uh, cut sound. But I have other things that sort of put a, put a little uh, thing on the front of a note. Like if it's an open string, I might go. Uh, but, you know, to get this. There's a huge amount of adaptation that goes on. And, you know, if I could give any um, encouragement to a somebody who's struggling to get all the detail of Irish music on this instrument, I would say, stop. <laughs> stop, don't do that. Because, <laughs> first of all, everybody's adapting it for their instrument, right? We have this tendency to think that if we can't do it exactly like that concertina player is or that accordion player or that fiddle player, then we're doing it wrong. But I would assure anybody that if you get the pulse into your playing first and add ornaments where they suit the instrument, um, you're going to be welcome in any session. But if you bog down the pulse by trying to get every detail that might exist in some, on some other instrument, it's not going to be... Happy, <laughs> happy making. <laughs> Such words of wisdom. That's that's really really helpful. <laughs> Anything smaller than an eighth note is an ornament, as far as I'm mm. concerned. It doesn't have to be there, so you don't have to go. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one I was thinking. Of. Right. Uh -huh. You can phrase the music how you like, and nothing's. Nothing's got to be there. That's so helpful. I um, I think that's like another fear of mine too, is just knowing how to treat the melody, like what embellishments to add, what embellishments to take away, and having the freedom to be able to do that. That just like brings so much joy to playing and music, I feel like. Exactly. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. No pressure. It's great. <laughs> I feel inspired. Yeah. I'm going to go go work on the rights of man and see if I can make it sound <laughs> better. <laughs> it's kind of a classic example for that. I know you use thicker picks, not to get too into the gear of everything, mm -hmm. but I know Irish mandolin is, you know, historically often use thinner picks on the mandolin 
just because right. it's often, I guess, seen as a utility instrument alongside bouzouki and guitar and all these other things. Um, and I think that's also spillover from banjo technique. Which sounds great, you know, like using a thin pick on a tenor banjo. And yeah. I know some people prefer the sound of a thinner pick on the mandolin too, but um, I'm curious about your personal journey to finding a thicker pick in this music and what the precedence has been for the mandolin with um, you know, these thicker picks that we usually use on the mandolin here in the States. It's kind of, a, it, it, it is a, a, an interesting thing and I, it's still uh, the case that I'm kind of an, like in Ireland they play with, most players play with quite a thin pick. So when I, my, in terms of how I got there, when I first started playing, I had no idea that, you know, this thing mattered. My mandolin that I play was my grandfather's. So when I opened the case, there were some picks in the case. So that's what I used, right? Mm -hmm. And as a super naive young player, um, I went and I traveled to Ireland and people said, what are you playing with that pick for? <laughs> Here, play with this, you know, and they handed me a very thin pick. And so I did. So I switched to a very thin pick. And over time, I just found that I did not get the tone that I wanted to get from the instrument. So I kept going a little thicker and a little thicker and a little thicker. And, and I found that I could keep the detail that I wanted, the triplets and such, but, um, but I got a nicer sound off mm -hmm. the instrument with a heavier pick. So where I settled is a, a one millimeter, which to American players is relatively thin, right? Mm -hmm. It's thinner than most bluegrass players play with. And, it's, and to an Irish player is quite thick. So I, I, I kind of tried to get the best of both worlds. Um, it, you get used to a certain pick on a certain instrument in terms of the tone it produces and such. So um, I have found that, um, I don't know, like we could go off on a huge rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> go down the rabbit hole. But um, yeah, I've been playing with the same pick for a long time. And, and I also favor the roundy, roundier things. This is typically more, Irish players typically use a more pointy sure. um, pick. But there are some times when the music's going fast, I wish I had a little more attack from a pointier pick again. You know, so right. yeah, it's always a trade-off. Yeah, it seems like, you know, the thinner picks might be easier to use at first, but then have limitations in, in the long run as far as sound production and volume. But yeah, I know what you mean. Sometimes yeah. you just have to make sacrifices in one way or the other, I guess. Yeah, everything's a compromise, it you is. know, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I But I, for, for me, I was able to keep the detail I wanted in terms of getting the triplets with a heavier pick. And I, I think that the factors of getting that... Um, are are there's so many subtle differences in grip and um pointiness and um pick angle and bevel and you know there's like lots of subtle things that you can monkey with slight changes in pick grip can help people who are not able to get think they can't do triplets you know it's like mm -hmm. well pull it in a little bit so don't have so much don't have the tail wagging the dog try that you know or <laughs> or if it's out here too much or just bring it back here a little bit or you know there's lots of small changes to try to 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 um cross the bridge that might seem insurmountable before you blame it on the gear <laughs> that's the easy thing to do that's what i like to do <laughs> yeah uh, it's easy to blame it on the gear when you were making that journey and you know making those decisions about your pick and right hand were you aware of any other mandolin players in irish music who were also using thicker picks i wasn't I, I really wasn't. I didn't wow. know anything about who was doing what. This was long before the sort of discussions on the internet and things like that. Oh, I mean, that's amazing. It seems like all the stuff you've arrived at have just been natural evolutions, which I think is so beautiful. You know, I, I wish I was more open to things like that instead of using stencils of other players as my, uh, as my guide. <laughs> it's the good news and the bad news, maybe, you know? Like, you can... It, it, it's great to have all this wealth of information at our finger fingertips, but also listen to your, you're like, nah, that's not for me. The, the thing is like, any, anytime you start to get like, you have to have this or this or this, right. um, you get into trouble because there's always some amazing player who does it completely differently. So I just feel like, uh, just try and give you the 
whatever the technique that's going to give you the most likely advantage to get there. I you know I'd love to hear more about your story with the instrument too. Like what what got you interested in the mandolin in the first place and Irish music in particular? And you mentioned you went over there for a while as well. I'd love to hear about those experiences too. Um, yeah, how did you get into this instrument? <laughs> so um, when I was going to college and I, I went to um, Cal, UC Berkeley, so not the music Berkeley, but the uh, university, um, I had uh, roommates two years in a row that had connections to Irish music in different ways. The, the, uh, the first one had just been, she was a avid traveler, still is, and uh, had just been back from a trip to Ireland and brought back, you know, vinyl, because <laughs> that's what there was at the time. Yeah. She brought back records and she brought back, you know, Paul Brady and Irvine, Welcome Here, Kind Stranger, and mm -hmm. and um, Planksy. And I, I started hearing this music and I was just like smitten. I loved mm -hmm. it. What I didn't know as I was hearing that music is that they were radical uh, game changers in the in the tradition, right? That they mm. th this was not typical. Everybody's doing it, sort of Irish music. Um, um, and then the next year, my roommate um, wanted to go Kaylee dancing. There was Kaylee dancing at a local pub um, in Berkeley, and and I was like, sure, I'll go with you, you know. And I did a little Kaylee dancing, and then I was like, well, nice. what are they doing, you know? When I <laughs> the, the musicians <laughs> play because it was live music playing for the Kaylee dancing and I was like I want to do that that looks like fun I really want to do that and having like this point of reference of uh having heard all these this mandolins and the music and combined with my grandfather played the mandolin and I knew there was a mandolin in my aunt's attic that I could get my hands on I was like I'm gonna play mandolin I had no idea it was fringy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, you know. So it's wow. you know, naivete, but um, so that's why mandolin for me. Well, it sounds like it was fate. That's amazing. All those things lining <laughs> up at once. I know. Yeah. That's... So you mentioned like Andy Irvine and Paul Brady. Were there any other like mandolin players that were really influential to you early on as you first started out? Um, I greatly admired David Grisman. I wasn't aware of any other Irish players. Right. Um, I heard David Grisman. I heard um, Nina Gerber when she was playing more man more mandolin at the time. Um, when she was a, a side person for um, Kate Wolf, I saw her perform. So it was only the only other mandolin players that I heard were American players. But I was into Irish music, so it actually never occurred to me to go to any of these American mandolin players and try and get some instruction. That would have been smart on my part. I, I'm sure I'd be a more versatile player at this point, but I was yeah. quite the monomaniac focused on Irish music. That's amazing. And yeah. so that was like the, the inspiration to head over to Ireland for a while. Were you there for, for a long time? That first trip, I was only there for three weeks or so. Um, yeah, but I was so lucky. Um, at the time, <laughs> uh, it, it, Andy Irvin played a an old Gibson. He was kind of known to be playing for playing an old Gibson. And I, if I walked in somewhere with my old Gibson case, um, I was quite welcome. Oh, you have a, come in, come in, you know, like, <laughs> so I, I was always welcomed and I was encouraged and I felt so lucky because um, I was clueless. But people showed me things. They were like, I'll teach you a tune if you teach me a tune. They wanted me to teach them an American tune or something, you know? Oh, it's so, so nice. It, it was fun. It was really fun. Um, stumbled amazing. along. Looking at your amazing career doesn't look like stumbling at all. <laughs> it seems like you, you've elevated the instrument in Irish music to to having its own identity, too. And I was wondering if you could speak on that as well, being one of the few musicians who make the mandolin a main instrument in this style. Um, how do you... How do you take all that stuff that's happened before um, and carve your own path in a way that's still hopefully honors what's come before us. It's interesting because it's difficult for me to think of um, myself in those terms that you just painted. You know, um, I sort of feel like I've been out there doing my own thing and I've kind of realized <clears throat> of late 
that I do play kind of differently than a lot of um, the playing that I hear now that I'm hearing <laughs> a lot of playing. You know, I kind of did have a, if you think of um, like language, how language develops, mm -hmm. um, when communities are in isolation, dialects diverge. Um, um, whereas if everybody is constantly talking to each other, you, you have a common dialect that doesn't change. And I feel like out here on the West Coast, um, I kind of found my, my own thing. And for many, many years, I didn't travel to Ireland a lot. I had a, um, I had a daughter at a relatively young age and really didn't travel um, or put a lot into my own musical um, career if I didn't consider myself having a musical career during the years of uh, being an active parent, if you will. Kind of didn't give myself that permission, if you will. So sort of emerging 20 years later, I kind of realized my style was a little different. Um, so if that contributes to the evolving mandolin styles, that are out there in Irish music, and I, I'm would be delighted and flattered to think that I had you know a little bit of that input, but um, it's amazing to me that now there is uh, there are multiple approaches and styles within mandolin and the tradition that it's grown enough to support that. Mm. Um, and that, as I, I've been listening um, online to young players coming, coming through the um, the cultus um, system, where the, the you know that win the championships and stuff, and there there's some videos on the cultus website, and I'm hearing a mix of styles in the young players. Some of them are very uh, banjo-ish, if you will, ah. in the light pick and very flickety, and and not a lot of emphasis on tone and. And yet, some are are um, getting more of a mandolin sound from from their instruments. So, mm -hmm. and uh, honestly, I don't know um, what the instruction um, situation is in Ireland. Like, who's teaching these kids? Are they are they combined mando banjo teachers? Are they mando players? I, I I actually don't know. I would love to know. I taught a workshop in Ennis this past um, November. And um, I, I, some local players were like, we're, there's not, there's a real lack of instruction on mandolin mm. um, that in their experience in Ireland. So I'm hoping to try and poke some, rattle some cages and say, hey, <laughs> <laughs> if you'll let me, I'd love to teach a little bit. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I don't know where, if that'll go anywhere. <laughs> I am. A, I'm an American outlier, you know. I was wondering too. I, you know, thinking, I've been thinking about the past a lot. But what about like the future of the instrument uh, and this style of music? Do you think? Do you think there? I don't know. Do you think there's a, a bright future? Do you think it's it's growing? Do you think? Um, I mean, it's so cool to hear that it's being accepted more into the the things uh, around the culture, like cultists and the flaws and things like that. Um, but you know, what do you think's next for the instrument in this style? Um, what do I think is next? That's a great question. You know, I, I, I'm seeing like these, like I mentioned Martin Howley. Um, there, there's uh, E Vagabonds is using mandolin a lot yeah, in their music. Great. Um, at, but they're uh, not but, and their music takes a lot of that uh, sort of planks the energy and brings it forward, I think. And then when I hear a player like Martin Howley, who's bringing... American influences, American stylings into his playing, as well as a super, super strong um, traditional. Um, you know, where's it going? I don't know, but there's there's more and more great mandolin playing out there. Um, so that makes me happy. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Again, thanks for checking out all of Marla's stuff and supporting her music. If you want to support the channel here, you can also like and subscribe. That goes a long way. Or join over on Patreon to get a bunch of added benefits like PDF transcriptions and backing tracks. But you probably know all that. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.